Well, good morning, Purpose Church. So glad that you're here today. I know we got a lot of families out for fall break, so I'm glad you're here joining us uh, in this beautiful October day. And uh, today we are starting our first ever series at Purpose Church on money, okay? Wow, not too many applause here. What's up with that? Okay, there we go. We got a couple. Some of you are like, man, this is my first time at church. I picked the wrong day to be here, right? And uh, in fact, just telling you made that uncomfortable, or maybe when you saw that handout, you felt uncomfortable, but I just want to encourage you uh, that if this is your first day and you're feeling a little uncomfortable, we are glad that you're here. Uh, In fact, the doors are not locked, okay? You could leave at any point if you want to, but here's what I will tell you. There are three things the world says the church should never talk about. The church should never talk about money, sex, or politics. What I find interesting is that God is Lord over every one of those areas, So as a church, we cannot uh, not speak to those areas. In fact, I cannot be a faithful preacher of God's word without talking about the most important areas of our life that many people are not experiencing freedom in. So if today is your first time at Purpose Church, I want to tell you, you actually picked the perfect time to be here. All right, and uh, here at Purpose Church, if this is your first time, we are a church who says amen. We get excited about the preaching of God's word. We love it when the word of God is preached. So at any point, if you want to say amen or clap or preach, feel free to do that. All right, it's going to be a good day at church. So this is our first time going through a money series, and the series is called Blessed and Wise. All right. Um, The reason it's called Blessed and Wise is because you could be blessed and stupid. Okay. Okay. But we want to help you be blessed and wise, all right? And uh, ultimately, the reason we're doing this series and we're talking about money is because Jesus talked about money a lot, okay? That is the first reason we're doing this series. In fact, in 16 of his 38 parables, Jesus talked about money. In all of Scripture, over 2,000 verses talk about possessions and money, which is more than prayer and faith combined, The second reason we're talking about this subject is that this is the number one area most uh, people in the United States get stressed by. Like, most people get stressed by this. In fact, there was a survey done by Capital One that said 71% of people are anxious about their money. 71%. And, And here's what I believe. If the Bible is as relevant today as the days it was written, and this is the living word of God, God is going to have something to say about something that 71% of people are stressed about. And here's the reason, number three, we're doing this series. Handling money God's way is a superpower. It truly is. If 71% of people are stressed by it, what would it look like for 100% of people in the church to not be stressed by it? And how incredible of a testimony would that be that wherever we go, we aren't stressed by the same things that the world is stressed by? You see, when the world is stressed, but the church has peace, we can look at others and say we are living in a different way. When other people are trying to keep up with the Joneses and they're comparing themselves, we have the chance to be able to walk in freedom. So this conversation is meant to help you experience freedom. It's not supposed to heap shame upon you. This is an invitation to obey God when it comes to stewardship because here's the foundation of living a life where you're free in the area of your finances and free in every other area of your life as well is that God has given you what you have. You don't own anything. It is God's. In fact, Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Everything is God's, including you, including your money, including your family, including your kids, including your spouse. You are God's own. Everything is God's. And the temptation is looking at our life and saying, everything is mine. And this is the biggest temptation we have when it comes to our money. In fact, this is why Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Um, In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, when we look at this, 
I think for a lot of us, we read this, and when he says you cannot uh, serve both God and money, he didn't say you can't serve both God and Satan. Why, why wouldn't he say you can't serve both God and Satan? Because the temptation of your life is not to serve Satan. The temptation of your life is to serve money. Satan will put things in your life that he wants you to place above God. And the vast majority of Christians miss this in their areas of life. And I want you to be free. I want you to experience the freedom of surrendering everything to Jesus and what he has the ability to do in your life. So the title of today's message is this, The Money Test. The Money Test. And I'm going to lay out to you from Scripture the test that God gives every believer that plainly shows whether or not you're trusting God in the area of your finances. It's the money test. So today, we are going to be talking about uh, the subject of tithing. Now, some of you, maybe you've heard that word before. Others of you, when you hear that word, you get uncomfortable. Uh, But what I want to do is I want to acknowledge four different groups of people that are in the room today. All right? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at my notes here for a moment because I wrote down some thoughts here. Um, But the first group of people here, when you hear the word tithing, you're these people. You are all about it. This group of people understand the principle and the practice of the tithe. They faithfully bring their tithe back to God, and they are excited we are teaching this because they have seen God's blessing, goodness, and faithfulness in this area of their life. The second group of people are this. They have no clue. They have no idea what tithing is. This is unclear to you. You've never been heard. You've never been taught this. You may be newer to the faith. We have a lot of new people coming to know Jesus at this church, and you are not knowledgeable about this subject. But today, you're going to be taught. The third group of people is, I know, but I don't want to. Okay? This group knows what the Bible says or has been taught, but simply doesn't want to. You've decided to ignore this subject and area when it comes to your discipleship. Now notice this. This is not a money issue. This is a discipleship issue. The last group is I don't think I can. This group looks at their finances and you say, there is no way I could ever tithe. Your situation is tight. It's tough to make ends meet. And things are difficult. Now, here's what I know. (laughs) I know there is a lot of heat around this subject. Inside of the church, outside of the church. And here's what you don't need. You don't need another man's opinion. What you need and what we all need is to look at God's word and say, what does the Bible actually say about this subject? Because we need the living word of God. We don't need people's opinions. And some of you, again, maybe your first time, maybe you've been coming, uh, when you hear the subject of tithing, here's the question that you ask. Is this just a church money grab? Okay, be honest. Some of you are thinking that. You don't have to raise your hands. And I totally understand you asking this. And many feel this when they look at churches, especially when they talk about tithing. And here's why. It's because maybe you've been to a church that's handled money improperly. And you're like, how in the world can I trust a tithe when so many churches handle money and finances poorly? Or you go on social media and you see like these multi-millionaire pastors um, who are really like 0.01% of pastors. And you assume that all pastors or churches are like that. Or maybe you grew up in a church that had a prosperity theology that it's like, hey, if you give the tithe, God is going to make you Jeff Bezos rich. Okay? And it just made you feel slimy, Right? And I'm not going to speak for other churches. I'm going to speak for here at Purpose. If you've come to our church for the last year and a half, you know this, is that we don't strong arm people to give. (laughs) At the end of service, we don't even pass a plate, all right? We're not going to be doing a special offering at the end of this service, okay? We'll do the normal thing that we do every single week. In fact, some of you, maybe you came here last week, and you're like, well, Josh, you've been giving monthly updates about the finances of the church. And I want to tell you, like, there's a difference between us being transparent as a church about where we are, which we did last week, and us talking about this issue from the area of discipleship, okay? We're not doing this because we need more money at the church. We're doing this because this is a discipleship issue, and here's my desire as your pastor. I want to help you know God more, and in light of that, I want to help you understand how do you view your resources in light of who God is, and if you're skeptical today, that's okay, In fact, right after the service, um, we are going to be doing an event called Find Your Place at Purpose, and you can ask any questions you want about our church, 
okay? Any questions, literally, right after service, 10 minutes after service, I will answer any questions. At our church, we handle our finances with wisdom, transparency, and accountability, and we will literally talk about that right after the service, and you can ask anything you want. Today, I want to teach the unfiltered truth of God. And the unfiltered truth of God in every area of our life is four things. It is always compassionate, it's always compelling, it is always convicting, and it will always set you free if you uh, do it in those areas of your life, okay? So according to Scripture, we've got to ask the question first, what is a tithe, okay? A tithe equals 10%. That's literally what it means. Tithe equals tenth. And uh, in Leviticus chapter 27, here's what it says. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So the first 10% is always God's. It is not yours, it's His. And where we see this even more clear in Scripture is through a prophet named Malachi. Now, in Malachi's time, this is in the Old Testament, there was a new temple. And the people believed since a new temple was built, they would not experience the same issues that they did in the past. They thought since there was a new temple, that people would improve their life and they would start acting more God-honoring. But the people were not. And this is a fascinating passage where God will give them a rebuke, and then they will come back and they will uh, question God, and then God gives them another statement. So one of the areas that God rebukes them is the area of the tithe. And that's where we're going to pick up in Malachi chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to there. It says this, From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. God's saying, you haven't been obeying me. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Verse 8, he says, will man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the, say that next word, test. test says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Okay, so what do we learn from this passage? Here's the the first thing we learn from this passage is that tithing uh, is bringing 10% of our earnings or income back to God's house. That's the first thing we do when we receive income. We give it back to God. We bring it back to God's house. Now, in the Old Testament, they lived in an agrarian community, okay? So they had crops and fruits, and they brought that to the storehouse, okay? Uh, Now, uh, unless you're doing like farm-to-table everything in your life, odds are you have some level of income when it comes to money, and we bring that to the storehouse. Now, the storehouse term has evolved uh, throughout Scripture because at the beginning of Scripture, it was the tabernacle. Then they built the temple. Then the church was established in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. And the storehouse turned into God's house, which is the church. Now we have to notice this. The storehouse is the church. The storehouse is not a nonprofit. Sometimes what I will hear is people will say, well, I tithe here and I tithe there and I tithe to there and I tithe to there. And no, 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 no. That's not what the tithe is. The tithe to the storehouse is not a nonprofit. It's not a missionary. It's not a food bank. It's not the nonprofit of your choosing. It is the church. Why? Because Jesus says he is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. You know what Jesus doesn't promise? Jesus says, I am not building a food bank. I'm not building a a women's shelter. He says, I am building the church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that we don't build women's shelters or food banks. Those come out of strong churches and benevolent people who've experienced the grace of God. And the church is called to steward that. The church is called to build into that. The church is called to financially resource those things. But, but it's through the church. So the full tithe goes to the storehouse. Now, there's no greater temptation with our money than just to think it is mine. And the reason we think that and the reason it is so easy to do that is because money wants to enslave you. And the more you get, the easier it is just to keep. 
So the, the three principles that we learn about the tithe from Malachi chapter 3 are this. Here's the first one. Tithing is right. To be simple, tithing is obedience to God. And obedience to God is always right. If God asks you to do something, you do it because he's God. Now, there are some people in this room, you may be well-versed in tithing, um, and you view tithing as just an Old Testament thing, not a New Testament thing. And essentially what people will ask is this, is tithing legalism? Legalism is when you do something for God so that he loves you more. So you think, well, do I just tithe so that God will love me more? No, 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 not at all. Like, like God loves you no matter what. God loves you whether you tithe or you don't tithe. But in the midst of this, the reason we tithe is to obey God. A lot of people will say uh, that tithing is just an Old Testament thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. Let me take you through some pieces of Scripture. At the beginning of Scripture, Abraham brings back a tithe before the tithe was literally even in the law to Melchizedek. Then the law is instituted and the tithe is instituted in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus reaffirms the tithe. Now, other people who are Christians will say, yes, but I don't live under the law anymore. I live under the grace of the New Testament. Therefore, I no longer need to tithe. And I would ask this question if that's your viewpoint. The problem with that viewpoint is then you would never give or bring back less than 10% because Jesus always elevated grace above the law. Let me give you an example. When Jesus looks at the people, he says in the, in the Old Testament, it says don't commit adultery. He says if you've even lusted, you've committed adultery in your heart. He says in the Old Testament, it says don't commit murder. But if you have anger in your heart, you've committed murder against your neighbor. He elevated grace. Zacchaeus, his life is changed by Jesus. He was a sinful tax collector, and he has one dinner with Jesus, and it changes everything. And he goes and he sits down at dinner. And after he's done, he feels compelled by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring back what he cheated out of the other people. And according to the law, he needed to bring a certain amount. And you know what Zacchaeus did? He brought back 4x what the law required. Why? Because grace always gives more than what the law requires. And that's what God calls for us. So when it comes to this in our life, I love what Randy Alcorn says. Here's what he says in his book. It says this, I've heard Christians argue often angrily that tithing is legalism. However, the average American gives 2.5%. Even using 10% as a measure, the Israelites were four times more responsive to the law of Moses than the average American Christian is to the grace of Christ. When we as New Testament believers live in a far more affluent society than ancient Israel, and we give only a fraction of that given by the poorest Old Testament believers, we surely must reevaluate our concept of grace-giving. And when you consider that we have the indwelling of the Spirit of God and they didn't, the contrast becomes even more glaring. So if you fear legalism, fine. Start at 11 or 12 <laughs> percent. I love that line. I think that was funny. Um, so what, do you, what else do we see from this passage? We, we see that, that tithing is right, but not only that, is that we see that tithing is not giving. And, and I think this is sometimes in churches we struggle with is that tithing is not giving. You see, uh, oftentimes what people will do is they will go up and, and pastors will say, thank you so much for your generosity. Yet, yet the tithe is bringing back to God. And there is a difference between bringing and giving. So for example, if you go and I pick you up at your house and I'm going to take you to the airport, um, I am picking you up. And if I take your car, I'm going to drive you to the airport. And when I drive you to the airport and I bring it back to you, <laughs> I'm not giving you your car back. I'm bringing you your car back because it was never mine to give in the first place. You see, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, it says this. It says, Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, How have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? There is a difference between bringing and giving. Have you ever been 
robbed before? Has anyone? When I was 18 years old, I had a 1992 Toyota Celica, beautiful car. Not really. Whenever it rained, there would be water all over my car seat, my, my seat, and it would be terrible. Couldn't even get past 65 miles an hour. If I ever braked too hard because a, a light turned yellow, my car would just randomly shut off, okay? That is what I was driving. And one day, I walk out in, into my car, and I notice that my car got broken into. And like an idiot, I left my wallet in the car, okay? So they steal my wallet, and I, had a, I was 18, so I did not have much money in there, but I had a prized possession in there, Okay? Before basketball games, we would always go to this place called Schlotzky's, okay? Some of you have been there. And this was before, like, I had a phone, okay? So they didn't have, like, an app, right? So you had one of those little punch cards. You know the punch cards that you have, right? And it was like, buy 10 sandwiches, get one sandwich free. Guys, I had 10 sandwiches punched on that card, and it got stolen. I was so bummed. I had more money in my wallet than the $5 sandwich, but that took hard work, right? I was so bummed. You see, when you get robbed, you feel violated. And what God is saying is, hey, hey, you are robbing me when you do not bring the full tithe to the storehouse. The tithe is not 2%, it's not 3%, it's bringing the full 10%. And some of you, you're wondering, like, where is God in the midst of your financial situation? Like, why am I not being blessed? And oftentimes, we sound like the people of Israel, and we're not trusting God. Like sometimes you trust God for a season and you begin tithing and then you get a raise or you get overtime or you get promotion and then you don't increase your tithe and bring it back to him that, that 10% over the raise and, and the promotion. And I'm just looking, I'm thinking, it's like God gave you that raise. God gave you that promotion. God gave you everything that you have. So when it comes to the tithe, the tithe is not the thing that we're just working towards so that we get there. The tithe is the floor of the Christian life. It's not the ceiling. It's the starting point, not the ending point. So tithing is right. Not only that, tithing is best. It's not just right. It is literally best. It is delightful. It is good. It is joyful that you can trust God with a tenth of whatever you have. It's amazing to know that we can do this because in verse 10, it says this, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Here's the problem. Many of us read this and we've read it through the lens of prosperity gospel, but I will tell you, this is material. This is material. I'm not going to be a pastor who stands up here and says, this is just all about you experiencing freedom and hope and a peace that surpasses all understanding when you tithe. That's helpful, but it is primarily material. It is literally a promise that God gives in Scripture. Therefore, I believe that if God says, I bring the tithe, he is going to open up heaven to bless me and provide for me in my life. I believe his word to be true. See, when you tithe, what you're doing is you're opening up your hands to the blessing of God in your life. And yes, it's helping you grow in your discipleship. Why? Because this is the very thing that's probably holding you back from trusting God. For most Christians, this is the biggest area of their life that they don't trust God in. And when you tithe, you're breaking the back of greed in your life. I've been pastoring for over a decade. You know what one sin that no one has ever confessed to me about? Greed. No one's ever been like, Josh, Pastor Josh, I'm just, I'm really struggling with greed. No one does it because no one ever thinks they're greedy. Yet when we read scripture, oftentimes most of us are greedy because God says, I'm giving this to you. And when you don't bring it back to him, He's saying, you're not trusting me. Now, some of you, you're thinking, well, I earned this money. This is my money. I went to work. God didn't go to work. I went to work. You would not have that job without God. (laughs) God gave you breath in your lungs. God gave you talent. God gave you connections. The job that you have, God gave it to you. God birthed you when he birthed you with the connections that you have to be able to live in this time, to be able to have an income or to be able to have the job that you have. And I thank God for that. I thank God that I was born in 1992 because God is all-knowing and he's all-powerful, but I don't think I would have made it in the 1800s, okay? I don't think I could have. God knew what he was doing when he placed you where he placed you. 
Uh, back in 2019, before we had our first daughter, I led a trip to Israel uh, for the church I was going to. And when you go to Israel, you go to two different seas, all right? You go to the Sea of Galilee, um, which is beautiful. So the water melts from the mountain, and it gathers in the sea, and it just gives water to the Jordan River. And there's so much life at the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. It's green. It's lush. There's fish and plants. And the way that happens is because it receives water, and then it doesn't just receive the water, it's in a constant exchange. I bring in the water, and then I let go of the water. Now, uh, you don't just go to the Sea of Galilee, you also go to the Dead Sea. Now, if you've ever been to the Dead Sea, this is like kind of a pretty picture, but when you go into the Dead Sea, uh, the Jordan River runs south to the Dead Sea, and all the water pools together. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. It's below sea level. Water gathers, and it just stays there, and, and it's full of salt and mineral and sol uh, sulfur. And it's kind of fun because when you go in it, since it's dead, like you literally float, so you can get some really cool pictures. But when you're there, it just looks so dead. So can I ask you, when it comes to your finances, when it comes to trusting God, are you like the Sea of Galilee, or are you like the Dead Sea? The Sea of Galilee... It brings water in and it exchanges water out. The Dead Sea is only for itself and it's only for its own consumption. Let me ask you, if you were God, who would you give more resources to? Would you give resources to people who are like the Sea of Galilee? Who, who receive and then they give and they live in a constant state of bringing back to God? Or would you give it to people who are in the Dead Sea, who are like the Dead Sea and everything is just for them? Proverbs chapter 11, 24 says this, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. This is the principle. The principle is that God gives you finances. You bring back to God. He provides more. And when you stop the cycle, you're ultimately robbing God. Tithing is trusting that God can do more with 90% entrusted to him than you're going to be able to do with 100% entrusted to yourself. It is a statement of faith and trust. The lie is to just try to do it by yourself. To say, I just, I got to do it by myself. Now here's the deal. Um, when it comes to our life, I, I truly believe that tithing is right and tithing is best. But it's also knowing that, that tithing is hard until you commit to it. You see, if you've never tithed before, and you're here today, and you're 35 years old, and you got four kids, yes, it's hard. In fact, I would just encourage you parents, this is the importance of teaching your kids money management principles now. I posted something on Instagram and asked how many people were taught finances growing up. 75% uh, of people who voted on that Instagram poll said no. Parents, we have to be better than that. We have to teach our kids in the next generation what does it look like to manage money God's way because when you do, it is a superpower. For my wife and I, um, I just, and I'm not saying this out of arrogance, I just, like, we've been tithing for 15 years. Like, I've personally been tithing since I got saved. So it's just like, it's not hard for us to do. For us, um, what God stretches us is we give over and above a tithe here at Purpose to God um, and we increase our generosity every single year. That's what God calls us to do, and that gets more difficult. Um, but for you, it may be really hard right now because you've never done it before. In fact, here are some just like common objections that people will have when it comes to the tithe. Here's the first one. 10%, that's crazy. You know, it's a lot of money. And I'll tell you, it is crazy. That is a lot of money. It is. Now, now understand I understand if you're hearing this message today and you're going through a financial difficulty or a hardship, you're thinking that this is crazy. But I'm going to encourage you to think about it a little bit differently too. You know what else is crazy? If you're a follower of Jesus, here's what you believe. You believe that God created the heavens and the earth. You believe that everybody is sinful and that God sent Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. 
that three days later, he rose, he was resurrected, he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit descended upon the earth on the day of Pentecost, 40 days after Jesus ascended, and the Holy Spirit lives in you. Literally, God dwells in your heart if you believe in Jesus, and that one day Jesus is coming back on a white horse. If you believe that, you're weird. I believe that. I'm weird, and I trust God that his money is his, and it's my opportunity to manage what is his. I don't just believe Jesus is saving me and that I get to go to heaven. I'm trusting that his word is true, and if he tells me to do something, I'm taking it at his word. I believe it. I trust it, and if he says it, he's going to do it because his word doesn't come back void. Now, the other one, yes. The other piece that a lot of people struggle with, and I totally get this, is like, I just, I don't think I can afford this. In fact, some of you, you're hearing this right now, and it's stressing you out. It's giving you worry and anxiety and fear. And and what you're thinking is this, like, Josh, uh, tithing just feels like another burden. It feels like another bill that I can't pay, and I don't have any money. Now, I understand that. I understand how tithing can feel overwhelming. I I understand that it may even feel impossible. Maybe you have so much debt right now, and that debt feels like a weight. In fact, in Scripture, it says that that when you have debt, the borrower is slave to the lender. And you may be thinking, why in the world would the church, or more specifically, why in the world would God ask me to tithe when I'm financially struggling? Like, I need it to get by. And if you're thinking that, I just want to tell you, those are fair thoughts. I understand why you feel that way. And as a church, I want to tell you, first of all, we want to help you manage your finances. This is probably top area of my life that I get so excited about. I literally could teach about this 52 weeks a year, okay? I won't, I promise, but I could. We want to help you manage your finances. There are Financial Peace University classes, which is run by an organization that Dave Ramsey leads. He lives out in Nashville, Tennessee, has built an incredible place for people to to learn about this. You can literally look it up. There are classes all over churches, um, all over this valley. There's online courses. If you are struggling with your finances, we want to help because this is an area of discipleship. On the other side of that, when it comes to the tithe, Uh, oftentimes we could walk around and we could probably give a mic and we could hear all the different hard stories of what you're walking through financially. And oftentimes when people lay out those things, what they want me as a pastor to do is to look at them and say, you're the exception. And I'll tell you, you are not the exception. I can't tell you you're the exception because if I tell you that you are the exception, what I'm saying is I don't actually believe this word to be true. Like, is it unreasonable to believe that the God of the universe has the ability to provide for you? Like, is it crazy to think that God has the ability to take your not enough and make it enough? I don't think it is. Now, if you're not going to just take God at his word, um, I think it's helpful to hear different examples of people who have done this. There's a couple that I know at our church, and um, I was talking to him a couple weeks ago, and this was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, they had a two and a half year old daughter uh, who had cancer and their hospital bills starting to get higher and they're going to church and there's some people in the church who are saying like, hey, you don't need to tithe right now. Like you're going through a really big hardship and like you don't need to tithe. And when I was talking to him about that, he's like, I just like, I thought that was crazy that they were telling me not to tithe. Like my two and a half year old is going through something harder and this is probably the hardest point in my life. Why would I stop trusting God now? Like God owns everything. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. His hospital, your hospital bills do not scare him. In fact, it could be the greatest opportunity in your life to see God work. Uh, Another couple at our church, I I sent them a message and I asked them what tithing meant to them and um, to kind of walk through their story. Here's what they said. We used to give God leftovers and wondered why we didn't have enough. When we committed to tithing first, everything changed. We never lacked and miraculously stayed afloat. Since then, we've received promotions, better paying jobs, and the blessing of financial security. God blessed our obedience. I want this for you. I want this to be your testimony. I I want you to experience a testimony that's different than the ways of the world. And say, I trust God in this area of my finances. And I will tell you, you can never experience the blessing without doing it. 
This is a typical um, I-Y-K-Y-K, okay? If you're younger, you know what that means. If you know, you know, okay? The only way you will ever know is if you do it. And I do not want you to be the 71% of people who are constantly stressed about money because God has the ability to work in your life. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about practically what does it look like to manage your finances well. But for this week, when you walked in, um, you should have received a card um, that has a 90-day tithe challenge on it. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take that out right now. On the back um, has notes from our talk today. And then on the other side is the 90-day tithe challenge. And here's what I'm asking. This is the only area of Scripture where God says to place him on a test, where God invites you to participate, where, where... If you are a Jesus follower and you call Purpose Church your home and you are not bringing a full tithe, 10% back to God, I'm going to encourage you and invite you to participate for 90 days and see what God does. If you start today, that will take you through January 12th. And here's what I believe will happen. I believe God and his word. It won't come back void. God will work in your life. Most people, we give spontaneously. That's not what God calls us to do. He calls us to give intentionally. The problem with giving spontaneously is you often keep more spontaneously, is that there is a lack of trust. So here's what I'm gonna encourage you to do. If you're feeling convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not trying to manipulate anybody, I want you to fill this out, and I want you to fill all of this out, and I want you to turn it into the giving boxes on the way out. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because we are going to send you resources this week. We're going to send you an email. We're also going to send you a book in the, ma- in the mail this week. So make sure to put your address down. And we want to encourage you. And we want to give you an opportunity to see God at work in your life. And here's what I want you to know. Like, I'm not personally checking your giving. You're not walking into our church. I'm like, oh, that's, this person gives this much and this person gives this much. We're not asking you for your W-2s, Okay. Uh, We obviously track giving for year-end purposes and budgeting, but we are not here to strong-arm you. We're here to invite you to trust God in this area of your life and to see what he has the ability to do. Because he is good. Because he is faithful. So I'm going to encourage you, fill out this card. You can turn it into the giving boxes on the way out, and we would love to help you take this next step. Ultimately, the reason we can trust this is we think about Jesus. Think about what he did for you. Think about what God did for you. In fact, think about the most famous Bible verse ever. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. What did, he gave his only son. God gave his first. God gave his best. And why did he do it? Because he loves you. So let's be a church who trusts God and submits to God. And we don't just submit to him, but we surrender every area of our life to him. We're going to do something a little bit differently today. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to your feet. Go ahead and stand to your feet. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I want to read a passage uh, that I believe has the ability to encourage you this morning. So if you've got your Bible, open up to Deuteronomy chapter 8. You can check it out on the screen. Here's what it says. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. This is the prayer of my heart for everybody here today. I'm going to end our service the way we end our service every single week where I'm going to pray and ask God to fulfill his purpose in you this week. Let's take a moment to pray, everybody. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are worthy of our trust, that we can surrender every area of our life to you. So God, allow us to be a church who doesn't just say we trust you, 
but we truly trust you in the area of our finances. And we believe, God, that you are going to bless and do exactly what you need to do. God, allow us to manage our finances in every other area of our life well this week. And God, I am believing that as we go out today, I am praying for blessing. Lord, I'm praying for influence, I'm praying for presence, and I'm praying for your protection over every single person here. And we believe that until we come back here next week, that you are gonna fulfill your purpose in us and that the best is yet to come. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jess. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We're so glad to have you. And hey, if you made a first time decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. It is the best decision that you will ever make. I wanna encourage you to go to our website, purposearizona.com slash connect card, and you'll see a connect card on the website. Go ahead and fill that out. It gives us a little bit of information about you and helps us come alongside you and support you as you start this journey. Also, if you just wanna connect with our church or if you wanna invest financially in what God is doing here in the Valley, all of the information is on the website, purposearizona.com. And lastly, we meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Desert Edge High School, and we'd love for you to join us. Be sure to follow us on social media for any other updates. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.